You always think of divorce as something that happens to other people. It could never happen to you. But it did. The marriage system is, is messed up because uh, we marry for love now. Love isn't always very logistical because they connected so much as people that they were hoping that the logistics would just work out and it, it just didn't work that way. So let's get the most awkward part of this video out of the way. Yes, I know I am the girl telling everyone if they didn't follow the perfect trad guide that I had figured out at 20 years old, they'd grow up to be alone or single mothers. The horror. All right, for those just tuning in, this is Lauren Southern. Uh, she's describing what has led to her divorce. Um, the reason, the probably the worldview that's important to keep in mind from where she's talking from is that she is a, a very conservative political pundit. She's been very, very spicy, um, particularly, I think probably the most noteworthy stuff would be like her stuff around like immigration specifically, with like uh, shooting like the flash gun or whatever. Um, and as a conservative Christian woman, she's now in the midst of a divorce, uh, which is a bit of a nightmare, not just because divorces sometimes are really amicable, right? Um, which is like, it sounds like Hunter Avalon's, for example, his divorce seems like it's mostly amicable. Um, divorces are still really awful. And then on top of that, it, her divorce is going to be really, really the great replacement theory as well. Thank you, old man. Yeah. Um, on top of that, this is like her life experience now is fully counter to things that she's going to like stand for right so there's going to be like this like weird tension this is why she's kind of talking about like this weird uh kind of tension that's existing of her like life behind the scenes versus her like political career i am no longer married and not by choice i've thought long and hard about how to talk about this because it's not easy for anyone this is like my fourth, maybe even fifth time filming this video, because quite frankly, I cried way too much the first few times I did. And that's not stuff I want immortalized on the internet. And I've only really talked about this story deeply with a small number of friends and family before now. And one of those friends observed correctly that no one goes into marriage thinking that they are going to get divorced. And that's true, but if you wanted to go the whole facts don't care about your feelings route, I could easily point out that nearly 50% of all marriages end in divorce. However, that does not change the reality that when you are wearing a white dress or a tuxedo and either watching someone walk down that aisle or walking down it yourself, you always think of divorce as something that happens to other people. It could never happen to you. But it did. Um, my husband left me. If any fact does not care about my feelings, uh, in the case of like receipts, to be honest, I'm more or less willing to extend the benefit of the doubt. I think if somebody says I have the receipts to back it, um, I'm probably willing to extend the benefit of the doubt, especially because, yeah, CounterPoints has like uh, outlined um, that he's, he's seen a lot of these receipts. If, for example, somebody else comes up and it, part of what's going to really depend for receipts is like the way that she speaks about the narrative, right? Like if she starts like painting people in a certain way that like is increasingly like confusing and maybe doesn't add up, well then like more receipts are going to be required. Receipts for what? Not totally sure yet because she hasn't got into it, but it sounds like she's going to make a number of claims about her life and her relationship that therefore might require. So like one receipt might be that she didn't choose to end the marriage feelings, it is that one. Now, many of you might hear me say this and still wonder why I'm going to talk about this at all, even if it's true. I don't blame you. <laughs> there was a time when I myself would have asked what kind of unstable narcissist splashes the details of their wedding and separation all over the internet. Part of me still would rather not talk about any of this. I have clearly avoided it for two years, but for better or for worse, I am a public figure, and if I take my ring off, as I should have a long while ago, people are going to have questions. And if I don't tell this story, it is very possible that someone with little to no empathy for me will, as often happens on the internet. Or rather, tell a garbled and inaccurate version of it in order to hurt or discredit me. And painful reality is already bad enough without having to correct a more painful lie. Now, if you have followed me for long enough, you probably know that I love making impulsive decisions that seem like a good idea at the time, but start to show their downsides awfully quickly once it is too late, which is exactly what happened here. Marriage was this 
massive dream for me. I mean, despite my media antics, traveling around the world, building this career, I genuinely did want that stay-at-home wife life that so many LARP about online. I really was just so desperate for this life that I had in my head that I assumed my husband had in his head as well. Um, and as a result of that, I rushed into marriage. Like a college kid who picks up the Communist Manifesto and decides to join the revolution, I simply never bothered to ask some of the most obvious questions like, can this person deliver what they claim to want? Or can I trust their promises, in this case vows? Or will reality simply break them into pieces? I think a really difficult thing here, especially for me as like somebody who's going to fall a lot more liberal, is that like the life that she's saying that she wants flies in like full major contradiction with her like work, but also the personality she's predisposed to to have that work, right? She's a very disagreeable, opinionated, confident woman. Um, and I'm not saying that these types of women can't become good trad con wives. Um, the issue is that like, if you're looking for a trad con wife, you're not really looking for a Lauren Southern, right? Like you're not looking for this like career driven, outspoken, hyper motivated woman. Um, the, like these things don't make sense. And I'm not saying that this like makes their, this is the problem, but I think it, it introduces a dynamic into this like traditional relationship that I think like necessarily had a juxtaposition at all times, which was like this weird tension of like who Lauren is as far as her career um, versus like the role that she like, even she wants, right? This is the issue is like sometimes the roles that we want in life aren't the roles that we're like well set up for. Um, and this is like a, the weird thing is like if you're liberal and you go through and talk about your divorce, particularly if they're like secular liberal, it doesn't really, like nobody's going to care about you getting a divorce. But because of her worldviews, um, it creates like a bigger, a bigger tension because like family or family units, super, super important. Um, let's keep watching. For any marriage, this is a question that cannot go unanswered. But as I was soon to learn, it was especially vital to know the answer in my case, because being married to me has its own unique challenges. The main one being, I am super, super controversial. And for someone with a respectable job like my husband had, that's a big problem. The thing is though, calling, calling it a respectable job is underselling the situation a bit. A lawyer is a respectable job. A doctor is a respectable job. You could even consider a teacher a respectable job. But for the most part, those respectable jobs do not require a security clearance. My husband's job did. And I know that there will be rampant speculation about what that means, but I really don't want to hurt his career any more than I may have already uh, by getting into the details of it. Sorry guys, I'm just adding this later, but I don't really know why I'm mincing my words here. Obviously, I do not want to hurt my ex's career, but at the same time, it's pretty damn obvious my ex worked for the feds. I know, um, enjoy the memes. It's all absurd and weird. He wasn't like head of right-wing investigations or anything like that. It was more of an innocuous role. But that whole apparatus, they know each other, they work amongst one another, and it sure as hell complicated things to say the least. It's really hard for me to talk about all of this in general, which is why I have it all written down on paper, putting on a strong face, but I have spent way too much time living in fear. It may sound ridiculous to some of you, but I do live in fear of the government for talking about stuff like this. I have suffered. My family have suffered as a result of this entanglement with the state and my activism. And I am a bit traumatized by it all, if I'm being honest. I have spent hours, days of my life with my newborn child in questioning sessions, wondering if I'll be allowed to see my family. I've been under active political investigation that I haven't talked about publicly, had the state detain me until I gave up all my tech devices and passwords to them. Even during times when I had no involvement in politics at all, I've been barred from multiple countries, including Australia now. And after all of this happens to you, it becomes really difficult to discern what is and isn't just invented paranoia in your head. It becomes hard to tell what could be done to you next if you say the wrong thing and if you could hurt the people that you love more. So I hope you can all understand why I'm being so awkward and vague in a lot of this video. I've... I'm a lot better now, I, I am, but it's it's still this like constant nagging. So I'm gonna actually 
kind of put in a point here. So one thing that I think is really interesting to kind of notice, at least for me, is I think a lot of people that are going to, again, politically fall to my side is going to be like, oh, you're traumatized by the government. Like, wow, you know, natural consequences, right? Yeah, that's how a lot of people I think might feel about what she's describing here. Um, but I think what's really interesting is what she's describing here is something, even though in many ways, I can't map onto her political career, right? She's made a bunch of choices I would personally have never made. Um, it's interesting to hear her describe the like sheer terror of the government, which I, even though I've never experienced anything like this, is something that, that feels relatable as far as like feeling like there's these individuals breathing down your neck and watching your every move and like how like kind of mind -y that would be, um, which is actually a really interesting thing to talk about she's not getting into this so this is kind of my aside it makes me think about what happens to like conservative pundits that get like radicalized over time and because i tend to focus on the lens of like how the media portrays them and how that probably in part is like driving them in a certain direction and also like certain things like in group think like they're often only engaging with others who think like them which are also like pulling their their worldview to a more extreme level but then I also think about like the like some of these like material responses as well, like things like uh, getting checkboard on planes, having Airbnb. I think she posted that her parents' accounts was struck from Airbnb just because they were related to her, which is like ridiculous. It doesn't even make any sense. There's no reason for that. Um, yeah, exactly. It's not it's not really just paranoia. Whether we believe that it's warranted or not, um, it's interesting to look at how state exerting that type of control is going to grow this sense of right-wing paranoia about big state um yeah so I'm, I'm not saying that i agree with her that these consequences are like warranted or not but i think it's a really interesting like look into understanding right-wing political figures and the effects of like background logistics that we're not really aware of and how that might actually affect like their their own thinking as well fear in the back of my head the lauren southern you knew who started in activism bright-eyed and bushy-tailed at uh you know 18 19 years old got the living shit beat out of her psychologically but i am uh, getting a lot better lately and making this video is one of those big moments of getting out of my paranoia conquering some of my fears so i hope some of you can appreciate that and understand why you know i'm beating around the bush with some topics in this video this is a big step for me but anyways uh back to what i was saying i mean all i will say is that pairing someone with a high level security clearance with an activist who obviously has problems with almost every government around the world for her anti-government sentiments that is going to be a nightmare no matter who the people are and we both knew that going into dating let alone marrying we knew it would be tough uh, we discussed the possibility that he might either lose his job or forfeit any chance at advancement if he were to marry me due to my activism. In fact, that and the massive distance between us were two of the main reasons for me being apprehensive about dating him in the first place. I didn't want to live in Australia or complicate his life's work for that matter, and I told him so very clearly. And yet he claimed to care so deeply, so much for me, that he was willing to switch careers if he had to. He would move to Canada at the... It feel like it's hard for people to date whom use the internet for a living whether political or on events it can blow up at any moment. Yeah. It feels like the people who date whom use the events it can blow up at any moment. Absolutely. It's a problem with, like, with the internet. It's why like in many ways like the internet, we've got to find a way to like not have this so... Like there's no there's no law it's the wild west and I, it's pro it's not it's not good the internet chews up and spits people out there's almost nobody that comes away from content creation unscathed and without any scar tissue it seems like unless you are essentially super 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 sanitized uh where you bother nobody right like vsauce vsauce is like does fine but you can't really talk about like big ideas ever um and really come away unscathed from the internet, which is uh, sad. And I'm not saying I'm not saying that like again, poor people will be like, yeah, but she said awful things. That's true, right? Part of part of the issue 
is that the the scarring that a person gets by going through the space is somewhat earned. You say spicy things, you say things that upset people, you say things that people strongly and vehemently disagree with or think are dangerous, they're going to attack you. And to be honest, they have a, war a reason to, they probably should. Uh, that's kind of what idea discourse is. Um, and yet it's like, it's like a human's mind isn't meant for this type of like warring and it like, I think I was describing it to somebody last night, like with the, with the situation that's like going on behind the scenes with like, um, PS and whatnot, just like constantly like harassing me for a year. It's like, it, it's like a sweater. It's like a, you have a sweater with like a little string and then you like tug it and it like starts to unravel the sweater. And at first when you're a content creator, you're like, yeah, it's unraveling sort of it's like one string, not a big deal. Problem is that like you look away and then you look back six months later and like your sl sleeve is in tatters and the seams are starting to pull. Right. And then you're like, oh, f my sweater's kind of ruined. And then you're trying to like fix it. But as you're fixing it, it's kind of getting tugged and pulled at different points elsewhere, um, which is why I think so many people, particularly if they're involved in any level of like politics or anything contentious at all, um, it just like chews them up and spits them out, which is why. Yeah, you have to be extremely valiant and brave uh, in this space and. Hopefully you're right. <laughs> hopefully history vindicates you, I guess drop of a hat to be with me and you know that was one of those head over heels romantic moments that i think every girl wants to hear the career it's just not as important as you i'm, I'm willing to give it up and before you scoff um know this he did mean it because he did move to canada to be with me and he did change jobs and during his time here we had some truly beautiful moments together which i will never regret the most important of which being our decision to get married and have a son I wanted a son and a daughter, uh, so did he. So really, you know, looking at the situation at the time, it was like, what's the problem here? <sighs> well, the problem was that, like with most couples, people have honeymoon periods. And when ours ended and the more mundane life set in, I was actually pretty content with it. I was really happy with it. But for my husband, it seemed like the reality of losing his life's work was beginning to set in. And understandably so. To give up his home and job that he had spent every day of his life working towards risked so much for, achieved all this status and respect to just throw that away and be nobody. Yeah, I think, I think if you're going to give up on like your career pursuits to be with somebody, you need to make sure that before you make that decision, your future self won't come to regret it. And if there's any question in your mind that you might come to regret it or that your future self won't really consent to this, you really shouldn't do it, right? This is where like, in many ways, like our marriage system is, is messed up because uh, we marry for love now, uh, but love isn't always very logistical. Um, so you get in situations with relationships where just logistics wise, it doesn't work. Um, despite you both really, really wanting it to. And so you either have to change everything and then be okay with that. But the issue is once you've like committed to this, you can't change something and then later on resent your partner for the choice you made to change for them. Um, yeah. If you're in your honeymoon phase, you might not question it though. Exactly. Right. And this is like, this is like the, this is the issue is from the outside. It's really easy for us to look at that and be like, yeah, that probably wasn't a wise decision, but also like hindsight, we know that they're divorced. This story could have ended with, he gave up his career moved in. They had a bunch of kids together. It was amazing. They did grow old. He became completely content with his new life because his family became his purpose and he didn't care about the career shit anymore. That, that could have been the story. And so the issue is like, it's not just about the honeymoon. It's not just about like, what's the wise decision, but it's about making a decision that your like past, present and future self can consent to, and then sticking to that decision. And if you're starting to have issues with it, not blaming your partner for decisions that you've made. Um, and this is like the complicated, like messiness of marriage is that like hindsight, hindsight is like the worst, um, because at the time you're just doing the best and making the decisions with the information you have available for you. Right. I'm sure that when he said that he wanted to like give up his career and like pursue the relationship and stuff with her, I'm sure he meant it. I'm sure that's exactly how he felt. Um, uh, that just got harder and harder for him to cope with, especially once he started doing the more boring work he had in Canada and found it, frankly, intolerable. 
And it's not that I simply left him alone with these feelings. I did not. I did my best to comfort and make things easier for him. I obviously had some savings from doing YouTube before and I used that to split rent, pay for groceries and life costs and kind of take that burden off his shoulders whenever I could. Took care of the home, our child, both when I was pregnant and uh, after I'd given birth because that's what you do in a partnership. You give 100% of what you can to build up, you know, the team. But it wasn't enough uh, because the fact was he was still trapped in jobs that felt like dead ends after what he had given up before. So perhaps it is not surprising that a few months or so after I'd given birth, he accepted a new job in Australia, one that was closer to the kind of work that he had left behind. And when I say he accepted it, um, I mean without my input. He didn't consult me at all. He just announced one day that we were moving to Australia. Which again, I understand, when you feel as trapped as he clearly did, you will gnaw off your own leg, and telling your wife to pack a suitcase probably felt minor in comparison. But that does not change the fact that he had said we would live in Canada, and finding this out right after I had given birth and just started to rebuild my community support systems after such a chaotic change in my life came as quite a shock. All of which is to say I was a little upset. Um, a little upset he hadn't consulted me because I felt we should make these decisions together as a couple. And to be clear, I didn't actually refuse to go. I just told him I would have had an easier time supporting him in making that move if we had talked about it properly beforehand. Which, rather than kind of change his tune and, and you know, take the approach that I wish we had in the first place of talking about it together, his response was to say I either make the move or he would divorce me. Now, when I made my wedding vows, I meant them, in sickness and in health, for as long as you both shall live. Yeah, I think it's super important. A bunch of people are going to probably start feeling like this is super one-sided. It's her explaining her experience of the story. Um, one thing that I've, like, really learned, especially, like, in, like, talking with multiple couples and stuff, and even, like, not having issues, is that... I would say that Lauren is approaching this as maximally best faith as possible for the situation. But the reality is, of course, it's going to be one-sided, right? Like when Nick and I were separated, despite the fact that when I would talk to my friends, for example, about the situation, I actually did my best to like try to be charitable to Nick. Um, there's still a bunch of subtle stuff that I like missed out on talking about in the conversation subtle things that i was blind to in myself things like little blind spots that i didn't even realize was going on that was creating some of the dynamic and so people being like well this is one-sided well it's her telling the story of her relationship um of course it is but what i think is noteworthy here is she's not going above and beyond to paint him with certain types of language right like when we compare this for example not that it's super similar but when mld was addressing allegations the way that he was presenting essentially his narrative enemies right because in, in this is if this is a story of her life there are certain characters that are going to emerge like her husband that are absolutely antagonistic right um the enemies of the story essentially not that she's painting him as like an enemy um the way that people go about talking about the antagonists in their own story really matters. It's important to remember that you're only hearing one person's experience of seeing them as the antagonist, of that person becoming the antagonist in their life, right? So there might be complexities that's missing, but I don't think it's always fair to go to the person sharing their own personal experience and go, you need to represent your story in an unbiased, objective way. That doesn't exist in personal narratives in life and like life stories. Um, what you can ask for is as much charitability as you can offer the other person, um not lying <laughs> not lying about the other person and doing your best to be as humble and like uh recog recognizing your own faults as maximally as possible um, and like take accountability for those things that would be the thing that you're looking for in a personal story about their experience with something i'm not sure how long they were married for i don't know if she said that period so hearing that divorce was even on the table for him was devastating and life-changing in its own right. Because from my perspective, the entire point of being married was that you will not leave each other. You support each other through anything, no matter what. And because even thinking about the idea was too upsetting, let alone risking it actually happen, I ultimately decided to put my misgivings aside and simply made the trip to Australia with him. Although I did have friends and family telling me that... Uh, 
th these were not the pretenses I should be making a move like that under. And maybe it seems naive to you watching and you can kind of see, see how the future is going to go here, but I was still bright eyed and bushy tailed with a child and a husband that I loved and, and believed that things would, that was just a one time occurrence that that was a one-time threat and uh, our marriage certainly did not have an easier time in Australia getting in as I've already explained before was a nightmare for me one which ultimately required me to give up my political career yet even without politics I was already staring down the barrel of travel restrictions or similar issues and all well my husband was not only seemingly ashamed of me but paranoid that discovery of our marriage by certain individuals would impact his work at his new job even under the best possible circumstances, feelings like that would eventually curdle into resentment. And they did here. His resentment did not come from nowhere. Um, his position undoubtedly suffered when his colleagues became aware that I was his wife, but even so, it was absolutely not healthy for either of us. He was forced to live with a wife who he increasingly saw as a millstone around his neck, whereas I, I was trapped alone in Australia with no family or friends and a husband who resented me. The low point of this all was probably lockdown, which for me was so traumatic that I have repressed large chunks of my memory. I cannot tell you guys how lonely and painful it was being stuck by myself in a big house all day with someone who for weeks at a time would hardly acknowledge me beyond a dismissive hello, or worse, just give me reminders of what absolute dead weight I was for his life. Brittany, Brittany, Brittany. Hi, hey, Brittany. I think Lauren has issues taking responsibility, but she didn't sign up for a marriage where her husband surprised her with random moves. That seems insane, no matter the marriage. Yeah, I think there's a really big issue where it sounds like the husband really, really liked her and then made a bunch of decisions and commitments to her to make the relationship work with her. That when he made the commitments he was down for, but his future self wasn't, right? They were unwise commitments. He So I think probably a big part of responsibility if I'm like neutralizing this as much as possible that I'm hearing is the husband is not thinking about his future self's needs and if he will actually be okay with moving to Canada and giving up his career right the answer was he wasn't okay with either of these things the issue is that's not Lauren's fault um particularly if when they communicated he was fully consensually on board to the move right so like him choosing to just like up and and move her she actually stated i'm sure for him that felt like a pretty small ask uh, based on the like the level of like distress that he was probably experiencing which is probably true for him right that shows some of empathy for his side which is good um but it's also an unfair ask right you don't it's not because it wasn't really an ask it was a demand um and it was a demand based on a past decision that he had made that his future self couldn't have consented to like an unwise decision um, there might even be some piece that people might say like, well, maybe Lauren should have also been like, is it reasonable for this guy to like give up all of his life? I think that would be fair to say, um, of essentially, you probably shouldn't have bought it when he said that he would be willing to like give up all this stuff, especially if he was a highly career motivated individual, which if he's a fed, he probably is. Um, uh, there's a lot of people who become feds are very intense career people. Um, but at the end of the day, if he was expressing consent to it he's an adult there um it sounds like a lot in their relationship both of them kind of hoped that love would be enough to overcome major logistical barriers and they kind of like created this situation where because they connected so much as people that they were hoping that the logistics would just work out and it it just didn't work that way yeah. career i mean even going outside, the streets were mostly empty except a couple kangaroos. There weren't community events going on. I couldn't meet new people. It was like I was living in this eternal limbo in that country, tormented by the idea that my husband might leave us at any moment, um, particularly tormented because I still loved him, but also having left work to be a stay-at-home mom, I certainly did not have enough funds to support myself or our son if he were to do so and no way to return home to my family because of government COVID restrictions at the time. I didn't want to get too political at this part of the video, um, but I really don't 
think people realize, certainly not governments, the absolute depths of darkness that lockdown brought to some of us. I, as I mentioned earlier, I filmed this section like three times and I cried the first few times. I, <laughs> I'm finally at a point where I can read this without breaking down, but it was just completely horrific for me. And I don't think my mental health has even recovered to this day. As I said, can barely remember many of those months because I just, I don't want to rekindle them in my mind. And make no mistake, you know, I was uh, It seems a bit hyperbolic. Is she living in the deep outback with no car? Australia has people. Well, the issue is she's a young mom, fully uprooted from, it sounds like a very connected family. So like, it's not that she has no capacity to make friends, but being a young new Christian mom in a brand new country, um, particularly if you're like high anxious, um, because of your move and your relationship status, making relationships in the midst of a COVID lockdown is actually insanely difficult, right? Like Australia has people, but they was in the midst of a very intense lockdown. So even like trying to meet people at church, even churches that were maybe like more lax with COVID restrictions is still gonna be damn near impossible. And she's fully dis dis disconnected now from her like support network. Just like, by the way, her husband was when he moved to Canada. This is why like a lot of like intercontinental moves for relationships can be really, really hard on couples because one of one of the person, one person is giving up their major support basis if they're, if they have a good familial relationship. Um, that's just inevitable, which is really tough and is the breeding ground for resentment. Um, where resentment can occur. Absolutely. And I'm not saying that that's good. Um, but essentially what she experienced in Australia was like a kind of an extreme version of in many ways, what her husband experienced when he moved to Canada, a disruption of community, social networks. Right. And then on top of that for her and for, on top of that for him was career disruption. And on top of this, the community loss was uh, COVID. Basic question. Could his future self seen his wife being so controversial that he loses his life's work and threaten every job after? Yeah, I mean, he literally could have seen that. His present self should have known that because he, he, he knew who Lauren Southern was. It's not like he didn't know that she was a controversial figure um, and kind of anti-government. So, yeah, it's not even his future self. His present self should have known. Okay, in my opinion, obviously, I'm just speaking from my opinion. Was trying, even though it was a a pretty depressing situation to be in. I spent literally every day, every day of my waking existence, desperately trying to think of ways to make my husband see me, to love me the way that he used to. If I just cooked dinner right, and if I made the perfect dessert, the perfect breakfast, if I ironed enough of his shirts, if I made the right amount of romantic gestures, then maybe, maybe he would feel differently about me. I really tried all of it, but nothing worked. It's clear to me now in retrospect that to my husband, our marriage was already over. And he was looking for every excuse, no matter how small, to end it in law as well as in fact, which might explain why I never so much as uttered the word divorce once when we were living together, and he brought it up easily over a hundred times. Um, and often over things that still make no sense to me to this day. But sense or no sense, I kept trying to fix whatever problems he would raise without regard for how possible they were because we were married. I think because he had acknowledged the threat to his career that marrying me would pose at the beginning of our relationship and seemingly accepted it, he never would use this as his reason for divorce, but it was something he brought up every day as a frustration, all while pinning his divorce reasons on seemingly less important things. One such complaint had to do with my ADHD. He told me he could not be with me unless I fixed it, like absolutely fixed it. So I tried, I went and I got officially diagnosed in Australia at a specified clinic. I began taking Vyvanse, which is a uh, like an ADHD stimulant drug. They've got others like Concerta, or you've probably heard of Ritalin. Um, I started taking that daily to try to manage it. I understand even now how frustrating having a partner with ADHD can be, largely because it frustrates me to have it. But I did everything one can possibly do to try to manage it and it still wasn't enough. I was repeatedly told that I was not making enough progress in that department. And um, oof, I, I, it seems like a silly thing to be so important to me. It's, you know, I've never really had it be an issue in the past. I've never even really had to take stimulants for it. But when it's 
your partner, the person you've married that cares about something, it makes it really important to you as well. And if you have ever been made to feel worthless or unlovable for something that you can't change about yourself, you know how deep this pain can go, how much it sucks. And it has taken me a long, long, long time to get over that properly. I'm someone who very much has the mindset of trying to be hyper introspective of what I could have done wrong in a situation, try to take maximum responsibility. So this is something that I think I hear a lot of people talking about and being like, so we just divorced her over the ADHD. My understanding is that's not even what she says here. Um, I think she explicitly says like ADHD became kind of like the easy venue of blaming. And I think that this is actually a really good way of characterizing resentment, right? When you have a growing, so if you have a growing resentment for your partner, for whatever it happens to be, um, your partner's work makes them just less available to them. Uh, so you're married to a partner and your partner uh, is a counselor. And therefore when your partner comes home, they're way less emotionally available than you would like, not because they're not trying and you even understand it, but over time it like creates this little seed of frustration and discontentment and that grows and festers. And if you don't kind of nip it off, because I said resentment is yours, that's your stuff to deal with. Um, it becomes like the sprout and then all of a sudden the termination of the relationship will be ADHD problems and it's like that, that's that's not the problem keep up the hard work thanks buddy right that's it's uh it's like a common trope like it's it's never about it's never about the presenting problem right if you have a couple come into like marriage and family therapists and they're like man my husband just like won't do the dishes it's never really about the dishes it's about so much more than the dishes it's about her extreme mental fatigue and feeling like she can't rely on her partner right and the simple way of blaming that and kind of having a simple direction for your emotions to d get dumped into is ADHD problems, or he's not cleaning up after himself enough, right? They become like these easy offsets for a much like deeper problem that's occurring within the couple. And this is something Nick and I noticed, for example, is I, when I was starting to grow like resentful towards Nick, um, he, I would get more and more upset about like cleanliness stuff. Like it would be like before, as long as he like did his dishes and stuff, I didn't mind like the odd sock, whatever. It wasn't that big of a deal. But as I got resentful, it's like every sock was a problem, you know. Now it wasn't just a problem that he was even was putting away his socks. It was also that his desk was dirty. And okay, well now his desk is clean, but he keeps leaving out his hot sauce, like whatever it is, right? And so I feel like the issue with resentment is it's always looking for an outsource, and that's and the topical issue in the relationship is never usually the issue. Like it is an issue. But it's, it's also evidence of a much deeper issue. You wouldn't divorce somebody over ADHD problems. That's not real. But you would divorce somebody who's cost you your job, who disrupted your life, and who at all times is a millstone around your neck, as she said, as somebody who you are ashamed of at work to be married to. That is a reason to divorce somebody. I'm not saying it's a good reason, but yeah. Ability, so I have maximum capacity to fix a problem. But no matter how much stimulants I took, I ultimately cannot change the way that my brain works, the brain that I was born with. And having this desperate need to make this problem right made me... Also, we're presuming this based on like only one side, obviously, just to be clear. Cripplingly self-critical about my ADHD. I know that we make fun of therapy culture, <laughs> but uh, my therapist told me something that really turned this around asking me point blank that if I wasn't deserving of love for my ADHD, then how could my son, who will likely have it as well, be deserving of love? And I cannot imagine a universe where that boy does not deserve every ounce of love I have in me. So with time, this has completely changed my perspective on the issue and been very healing. You know, there, there are a lot of people I know with bizarre, strange minds that don't work like everyone else's that I absolutely love in this world and find incredible. Now, while I certainly saw glimpses of the abyss, I do not want to make it seem like our lives were hell 24-7. Uh, that wouldn't be fair or true to suggest that. The start of our relationship was nothing like what I am describing now, otherwise why would I have entered it? Um, but even when things did get dark, 
Truly, we did have good days, and I would both hoard the memories of those days like little flecks of gold and tell everyone who would listen whenever they happened because that was the only reality I wanted anyone to know in my marriage. You know, it's the classic, you post all the best moments on Instagram so people see how happy you are. And I was convinced one way or another that I could make- Sorry, just a logistic, I just need to stand because I, I hurt my back uh, last week and it's been really hard to sit. It's just getting aggravated a bit make it be the only reality I knew in our marriage once I had just figured out how to fix everything. But uh, never, never got to that point. And ironically, it was his threats that eventually paved the way for our relationship to finally end. During one of our bad periods, uh, my husband told me to book a flight to Canada immediately because he was divorcing me. And I had listened, even though my savings were running out and flights out of Australia were nearly impossible to find, I somehow managed to get a flight. And because I knew I wouldn't have the money to book another one, and also because it might be years before another even existed, thanks to Australia's COVID policies, I didn't cancel it, even though obviously uh, I spent every day up until the flight point working on things, begging him to fix our marriage. And we went back through that up and down, up and down period to an up phase where he, he didn't want to divorce me. So when two deaths in my family eventually happened to coincide with this flight I had booked, I decided to actually make the trip, my son in tow, with the full understanding that I would come back in two weeks. I had my flights booked back, all of that, uh, once the funerals were over. After being so miserable with me for so long, you would think that my husband would welcome the chance to get me out of the house, right? Um, no. Instead, like everything else, my leaving for Canada became another reason to threaten divorce. He said he needed the support in Australia and our relationship was in such a bad spot that if I returned to Canada, he would simply have to end our marriage. Only this time, having not seen my family for so long, genuinely having funerals of extremely important people to me to attend, and perhaps no other chances for the foreseeable future to visit home. Honestly, my mom was in quite a bad mental health crisis after not seeing her grandson for so long. It was, and I was in a bad, much worse mental health crisis after feeling quite frankly deprived of love and people building me up as a, as a human being. And I desperately, desperately needed to just see my friends and family for this short period before, before going back. So I told him I loved him. I'd be back in two weeks, but I had to go. And somehow he actually eventually agreed uh, he said he wouldn't divorce me if I went to go visit my family and friends, but that lasted until I landed in Canada when he texted me and told me not to bother returning to Australia and that we should separate. And once again, I tried to change his mind. I spent thousands on counseling. I sent him basically all of the money I had left in my bank as if it would reduce some of the stress on his part and show my commitment. I begged him to stay together. He didn't listen, and ultimately he told our counselor, my parents, and, uh, and me that my ADHD was too much to handle and that he no longer believed I could be the partner he needed in life. I held out hope for a very long yeah. time. In fact, I would say I simply refused to accept reality for a long time. I'm sure there'll be people reading this who have been left by a loved one, particularly if it was someone you had children with, who will understand the type of crippling heartbreak this induces. It feels like for the rest of your life, you'll have this chronic aching pain like a phantom limb, the entire foundation of your world swept away. To have that happen changes you forever. And my heart goes out to anyone watching this who has been in that situation before. I cannot say it enough. Uh, when I said I do at my wedding, any thoughts of any other man on the entire planet disappeared from my mind. Therefore, in that to lose him was not just the end of that marriage, but the end of any marriage. Ever. Because to even comprehend the idea of being with anyone else felt like blasphemy against the one person who I'd sworn to never lose. Which meant that, in effect, any chance I had to build the happy family I had pined for my entire life was dead. And not just dead for me, but dead for my child, who I felt at the time would never have a father because I was too weak to make him stay. Which, if you have watched my channel at all, you know how completely intolerable I, in particular, would find that thought. I've worked through these feelings now and realized how unhealthy they were, but I certainly felt them to be wholly true at the time a few years ago when this happened. So I honestly, like, I had a complete mental health collapse. There's, there's really no other way of, of putting it. 
I stayed in a state of delusion. I refused to accept that my husband had left. Many of you will have seen me talking about him uh, in interviews or even mentioning him returning. And it's embarrassing, honestly, it is. It, and it's because I was on so much copium that I truly believed he was going to come back at some point that no matter what, I was gonna make it work. Whereas my husband was already saying that not only was it over, but he couldn't envision co-parenting our child and that moreover, maintaining any sort of relationship with us would cripple his ability to have a life going forward. Ultimately, it was my friends and family who put their foot down and stopped me risking. So, I think the biggest thing, because I think a couple of people are saying like there's something missing. Um, I suspect that Lauren is still in the middle of her journey. And I think the problem is that like, when I see people do healing, like in the process of their healing, even in myself, um, from what I've observed, I feel like people tend to go through this in a couple of phases. And I think the first phase is often allowing yourself high levels of self-compassion, um, realizing that sometimes just sucky stuff happens to you and that really sucks. And realizing that it broke you and that's really sad, it's tragic. And I think the next step of that, which, that step for a lot of people can be really, really hard. Um, some people fall into it easily and some people don't. So there's like the first, the first process in my, in my mind of healing is having compassion and self-love, right? Having compassion and self-love for yourself, understanding yourself complexly in the midst of basically a failed dream, right? In this case, she's grieving the dream of her life, which was a husband, a very trad con traditional life that she really, really wanted. And it's dead now it's dead. And, uh, she in part killed it. Right. Which is really awful, but it's, she didn't kill it alone. Right. That's the issue. And so there has to be that grieving process of this thing, this dream. I think all people have to do this, this dream of yourself being dead. And it sounds like this, like layers of copium is in part like a resistance to this part first, right? The first part, your dream is dead. You have to accept that it's gone. It's over. And then the next step of that, I think is, is the accountability piece, which is going, what were the processes and steps by which I helped kill my dream? What did, what am I at fault for? What did I contribute? How do I preserve this so that the next time something comes along that I really want, like a relationship, how do I make sure that I don't repeat this pattern? Is it that I selected the wrong partner? Did I not vet well enough? Did I say my vows too early and get married to somebody that I really shouldn't have? That's a really important thing of self accountability. Was I believing myself to be able to be a type of person and sold myself as the type of partner that I actually can't be right? So there's kind of like these two steps. And so I think what a lot of people are maybe wondering, and we're only like 30 minutes in, but is probably that next step of like the accountability piece. Um, which we might get to, um, but that might be what people are sensing is like off. That's at least what I'm seeing. Um, but remember the, the, the self-compassion bit of being like, my dream is dead and the grieving process has to happen first. But what if you feel so awful about the mistakes you did, you become paralyzed? Well, then that's like, that's all within the self-compassion piece, which is realizing as you take accountability, realizing if it's really bad and there's a lot that you did to kill the dream, figuring out or going, okay, I've messed up. How do I still love myself and take accountability? How do I say you are valuable, but also, bro, we got to work on this stuff, right? That's like the next step is um, not allowing your fear and shame of what you've done becoming so paralytic that you can never move forward, um, which goes back to the self-love and compassion. Thank you for that question. That's a great question. Asking even more, when my two weeks were up, uh, I wanted to go back to Australia, no matter what he said, and try to keep fixing my marriage, even if I was the only one who wanted to fix it, um, but my family refused. They said I was absolutely insane for even considering it. Honestly, I probably was. Uh, hell, even after I missed that return flight, I kept thinking the separation was temporary, that I would go back. I probably would have if I were able to, um, even just to repair some sort of friendship there. 
if COVID hadn't eventually shut down travel to and from Australia until my temporary travel visa expired, at which point the Australian government flat out refused to allow me in the country again. In fact, the Australian government became almost vengefully obsessed with Rolo spoke to the husband and is discussing it. Oh, really? Interesting. I probably can't get to that today because uh, I have to end stream in about an hour and a half for my Patreon stream afterwards, but uh, good to know. I'll check that out probably tomorrow. No, we're not on Twitch, although you can still sub to me there, but we're on Kick. So if you uh, if you want to support the stream, go check out the, the Kick page. Um, you can even sub there if you would like, but it's not free with Twitch Prime. To the point that when I did finally arrive for my flight to leave the country, officers actually pulled me into the back room at the airport and told me I had to give them all the passwords to my phone, my computers, hard drives, etc. if I wanted to see my family in Canada again. I mean... This The degree to which this government have messed with me, some random Canadian citizen with no criminal record, now on both political and personal levels, is pretty insane. And, you know, maybe it's because just because of my activism, or maybe it's because of who I was married to at the time, and the information they had access to, but, man, <laughs> they have not treated me well, that's for sure. To this day, I am still on their, their uh, vacuum consideration list, uh, which is the terrorist criminal consideration list that I was on before that they only took me off when I quit politics last time and at this point I really see no prospect of ever getting off it which means even if I wanted to I could never return to Australia believe me uh, certainly uh, over the last uh, couple of years I have tried to find a way I spoke to lawyers put in applications but nothing has worked I am barred from the country it really seemed that God and every force in the universe was trying to tell me, no, Lauren, you can't fix everything. That's, that's not how real life works. Sometimes life just doesn't go the way you want it to, no matter how hard you try. And sometimes there is a reason for that you just don't understand yet. I had to accept my fate that ultimately, despite sacrificing every aspect of myself to have things go the other way, I was now alone in the world raising a child. A single mother. Exactly the kind of cautionary horror story the right lays at the feet of the decadence of Western civilization. The kind of person they say would cease to exist if we would just return to tradition. Which brings me to a very important point here. There is a lot they get wrong here. In fact, there is a lot I got wrong and I didn't even know it at the time. Didn't even know it at the time. So let's get the most awkward part of this video out of the way. Yes, I know I am the girl who basically was the poster child for marriage and traditionalism, telling everyone if they didn't follow the perfect trad guide that I had figured out at 20 years old, they'd grow up to be alone or single mothers. I was the queen of the pick me's until I got picked. Oh boy, how the turntables. But when I spoke about these things in my early 20s, I was never lying. Uh, from the time I was little, I wanted nothing more in life than to be married and have kids and stay that way until I died. So when I thought I'd gotten that wish, well, you've just heard what happened. In reality, there is no perfect instructor for marriage. Certainly not a 20-year-old me. And even if you get a great instructor, there is no saying as an imperfect human being, you will follow every step the way they need to be followed. And when things do go wrong, there is certainly no instructor for when your partner tries to leave you or does leave you. Though I do have to thank the many... So, yeah, I think uh, uh, Time Watch brought up something that's really important. But something that's really interesting is there's something very tribalistically human about kind of the schadenfreude, which is like uh, taking pleasure in other people's misery, particularly when the misery in many ways to their worldview is self-created, right? So seeing a tradcon girl who talked to everyone about how uh, life would just be better if everyone was tradcons just like her, um, basically have that exact life blow up in her face, there is something satisfying about it, right? I understand that. Uh, it's 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 satisfying because you feel very vindicated in your criticisms of that if you're opposed to that worldview, right? The main thing that I think, and so I think there's a there's a space to be like, yeah, see, this trad con life isn't all it's cracked up to be, which is true. That is a valid criticism of the trad con relationship, right? 
Uh, there's a lot of TradCon relationships that fall apart and break apart in similar capacities. Um, the main thing is making sure that we're not delighting in the pain of somebody else, right? We can kind of be like vindicating me like natural consequences, you know, I can understand not, um, not feeling that bad, not having that much sympathy. I think that that's human. That's within like the neutral ground where I think we, in my view, where we should be really, really careful is reveling in it, celebrating it, thinking it's humorous and wonderful and funny and just like that reveling in like, God, I'm so glad that she's in pain. I think that's the part where we have to be really careful of. Um, but at the same time, I understand the human qualities that like create this. Um, one thing I will say about Lauren that's softening me particularly towards her is to see how her advocacy has shifted quite a bit. She's poking, pushing back a lot on more like anti-woman rhetoric, quite a bit against that. Uh, she's been pushing back against like kind of like grifting, lying conservatives. And so if that's come as a result of like suffering and kind of like seeing maybe the other side's worldview, I think that's a good thing. Um, would it be better if she had come to a similar worldview maybe without this? Maybe, but again, to assume that means that I have to take the hubristic position of assuming that I know what's right for the world. Um, but I think if you believe this to be genuine at all, we should absolutely reinforce people for being corrective in the right direction, especially if we think that like she was in the wrong direction before. So yeah. friends and family uh, of mine who have tried to fill that role. But as for the rest of the commentary I did as a 20 something year old on the ideals of marriage, whew, <laughs> let's get one thing out of the way first. Obviously the ideal situation for any child or marriage is for both parents to stay together. If the marriage itself is not abusive, I might have said that the ideal was the feminine housewife and the masculine breadwinner. And I won't lie after splitting bills in my marriage, that still honestly sounds pretty good, but I also can't ignore the fact that some of my most traumatic moments and experiences came when I was only a housewife and stay-at-home mom. Literally, when I had no choice but to stay home because of COVID lockdowns. My husband didn't want to be there, which made it very hard for me to want to be there, even though, to be honest, my husband gave every indication of having precisely the kind of benevolent, sexist attitudes that I lionized in my youth. But attitudes are not actions. Just finding a man or a woman with conservative opinions is no guarantee you'll find one who can live by those opinions when it ceases to be convenient. Particularly in a world where there's no more community to hold people accountable and where people, for the most part, choose their views and politics to be more of an aesthetic to paint their particular flavor of anger at the world rather than some deeply stable inner guide. In a world where divorce is far too common and has been for a long time, our culture, our humanness, and the reality of life will always complicate any dreams, ideological or otherwise, that we may wish to fulfill. The reality is, sometimes single parenthood is the best of bad options, or even the only option remaining, like in my case. We can talk all we want about trying to make those situations rare, but even with the best advice for would-be couples possible, some marriages are still not going to work. Some children are still going to end up with a single parent. Yes, parent, I am not going to pretend that this only applies to single moms, although they tend to be uh, more common. Single dads exist too, and I will always be just as proud of them as I am of myself, because I know what it is to be a single parent, to fight for your child, to love them so deeply that you overcome the pain of doing it alone. Yet for some reason, there is this ridiculous, absurd temptation to vilify the parent who stayed, regardless of the circumstances. Having been on both sides of the issue now, I can assure you, vilifying them does nothing to bring more healing. And if anything, antagonizes their children against the politics of those who condemn the person who has cared most for them their entire life. Yes, I made a bad choice. I got married way too quickly. That is something I need to take responsibility for. In retrospect, you know, he said all of the right things a conservative woman looking to have a family would want to hear, but there were plenty of red flags I could have picked up on had I cared to look. But once again, because of my childish internet politics, I treated marriage as this happily ever after fantasy where the credits just roll over your eternally smiling face. I felt so much pressure to get- Okay, this is getting in the angle of what I was saying is like the other half that would be 
in my mind, like something that I would want to hear, which is like the accountability. So my past self was childish, immature, unnuanced, unsophisticated, and vilified against a group needlessly without understanding the preconditions that often lead to their circumstances, um, which is, uh, which is good. Uh, she's also owned that she got married too quickly, that she intentionally ignored red flags, uh, because he like fitted into essentially her childish propagandic, uh, political narrative of an ideal spouse, um, which I think is actually, uh, what I was looking for was like the, this is like the sad stuff, but what everyone really wants to hear is like, I don't just want to hear your sob story, particularly not when like you've done a lot of things that a lot of people really hate, want to hear the accountability. Do you think that the way you spoke about relationships in the past was okay? So, yeah. Get married and start a family young, but I didn't bother to look too hard. Not when I was naively terrified of being 30 and unmarried and in love to boot. Do not make the same mistake. And here's the thing. The reason I am so adamant about making this critique right now in what would otherwise be much easier to just do as a simple statement on Twitter or something is because it is not just me. In fact, I would say... One of the biggest secrets on the political right is just how many people have had their relationships fall to bits, but will never talk about it. Most of my friends or acquaintances who lean politically right are getting into marriage problems, including people in the political sphere that are much smarter than me and will never do what I'm doing talking about it publicly. But it's not just them, it's also people with no public profile at all, who married their childhood sweethearts and have been married for a decade. Many of them hardcore Christians who, unlike me, checked all the boxes in the playbook of traditional life. And yet, most people I know are facing cataclysmic marriage problems that none of them could have predicted. Not that it's exclusive to the right, of course. Not at all. I've had heartbreaking numbers of friends sobbing to me on the phone about their relationships falling apart from progressives to non-political to far right. And yet all of them share one thing in common. Their lives came apart at the seams, unexpectedly in the same way that mine did. And what's even more heartbreaking than the fact of their struggles through this is that none of them, none of them feel comfortable talking about it publicly, or even sometimes with friends and family, because they feel like failures. And the very thought of it is too devastating to express. And it's even worse for those in the public eye, because failing is definitely not an opportunity to improve on the internet these days. Oh no, it is not a time where you reach out for help from the loving masses. It is blood in the water. Which means that a ton of these people are stuck pantomiming marriages that have ceased to exist, stuck in this eternal dance with the corpse of a long dead relationship because they are too afraid to stop moving and let everyone see that it is a corpse. Loving the Lauren content. Holding out for a humanizing. Especially when people's public images and their paychecks rely on this stuff. And I can promise you this. It is a lot more people than you think. A lot more. I'm basically doing full-time e-influencer therapy sometimes, and I love you guys. Don't worry. Uh, anyone who talks to me about their stuff and who I've talked to about all of this that I'm chatting about now, um, that, is, that is in a vault. Everyone's, everyone's struggling and ready to talk about or never ready to talk about with the public uh, the things they're going through when, whenever it suits them. That's for you. I would never, ever reveal any of your secrets online. Don't worry. Is she holding herself accountable? She puts him as having red flags and him saying the right things. She's young and naive in this narrative. I th I've been thinking a lot about accountability, uh, actually just for myself, which is, I think, I think we do a lot of things that feel like accountability that isn't. So I'll talk about my past self. I'll, I, if I'm ever going to critique people, I'll try to throw myself on the bus first. In the past, I used to take me being kind of like self-loathing and hyper self-critical as accountability because of being so damn mean to myself. I was like, of course I'm being accountable. I'm saying that I'm a horrible person. I'm taking accountability. I'm trash. The problem is it isn't accountability. It has no measurable impact on any of the people that I've harmed. And it's not even real, right? I'm not, a lot of the like past mistakes that I've made are mistakes. It also doesn't make me human trash, right? Uh, that title should probably be reserved for specific things. And if by my standards, some of my past wrongs were makes me human trash, then like other people are fucked, right? Um, so I think sometimes we'll take hyper self-criticalness and feeling really bad about something as accountability. There's another thing that I've noticed, again, that I've noticed that I do, that is another form of like taking accountability that isn't, where it's essentially 
If you've ever taken an ice shower, okay? I don't know if any of you guys have ever taken an ice shower or an ice bath, but you're supposed to turn the water on as cold as possible, and then you get in, and it's awful, okay? And I hate ice baths but and ice showers, but they're really good at me handling, like, acute uh, anxiety spikes. So, like, if I start, like, getting so anxious that I can't eat, for example, from, like, any type of situation, ice showers are probably it's like slapping me in the face it just like gets my acute anxiety like instantly down when like nothing else is working but so i will take ice showers but i've noticed one thing that i'll do is i turn on the water to cold and then i always turn on just a little bit of warm so it's just a, a little less cold i'm not saying that you guys should do ice showers i don't give a f what you do i'm just telling you what i do okay the, the ice showers isn't the point the point is i'll turn on just a little bit of warm water so it is a little less cold. So I'll still do an ice shower. It's still fucking cold. And nobody can tell me that I'm not doing it. And what I realized is in many ways, I think we approach accountability like this. We're like, we're like, I'm absolutely going to be accountable for my actions and you know, fully realize the ramifications of my behavior. And I'm gonna turn on a little bit of warm water so it hits a little bit easier. It's a little bit easier of a pill to swallow for me. And the issue with this type of accountability is it looks just like accountability, but when everyone hears it, it feels a little bit off. It feels a little bit copy, but nobody can really put their finger on why, because I'm like, what do you mean? I did the ice shower. And everyone's like, well, that's true. But nobody knows that I'm turning on just a little bit of warm water. And again, the ice shower isn't the point. The, the ice shower is a metaphor, in case you're not picking that up. So the, the issue is sometimes we pretend to have self-accountability. And what we're mostly doing is like self-flagellation, which isn't helpful to anyone. It's like the worst form of accountability. And then another form of accountability do we do is mostly accountability, but with enough squeaking room to make the pill easier to swallow. But the squeaking room isn't so big that we don't have plausible deniability that we didn't do it. And this is like another way I think that people like eke away from taking full accountability from a situation, right? So it's like when Vash said, you know, my husband is full of red flags, but I was like young and naive. And it's like, yeah, but there's more there because being young and naive isn't actually a bad thing, right? You're kind of still the victim there. There's something more there. Young and naive is an issue. You did miss things. You had kind of a childish like interpretation. But there's something else there. There's a little bit more there that we're not really owning up to, which is probably because it's a hard pill to swallow. Maybe she doesn't know. And I could be wrong. I could just be like making stuff up. But sorry, self-flagellation is when it's like a it's like a old priest thing where they would take like whips and like whip themselves in prayer to like punish themselves for sin and stuff. Sorry. <laughs> Um, and so I'm just figuring out the second form of accountability, so I don't have the best language for it. So I can't even like describe to you good examples of it happening, but I've noticed myself doing this, right? Where I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like if Nick and I get into a fight and he's like, well, it was like not super fair how you like delivered this. I'm like, that's true. That's true. Um, but you know, like I was also feeling a little bit upset, but like, it's true. I could have been nicer, but also like, you know, this is a bit of my out, you know? Um. That's me. I think I say I'm accountable for my actions, but I often run away instead of dealing with whatever I did. I'm still a child and I have tantrums and still hold grudges and act childishly when I'm mad. Um, this is my own choice to share my most devastating life moments with the world because I am an insane person, clearly. And, you know, I, I gotta say, it is a tragedy that myself, among many others, have created a political and online culture that, quite frankly, has so little openness and understanding to the broken human condition that not only does it leave most of the people in the public eye skittering around in the background on secret calls trying to work through their emotional issues because they constantly have to lie to the audience, but it also, at the same time, because of that, uh, does not prepare adherence of their ideologies for reality because they're not hearing any of the realities of our lives. We yabber on all day about telling hard truths, but somehow those truths are only ever inconvenient for our enemies and never for ourselves, which means our enemies get more broken by ignoring us and we get more broken by never turning that gaze on ourselves. I say we because I know what a huge role I have played in building this epistemological wall against self-awareness for so many people. 
I am sorry for that, and if it makes you feel better, know that unlike Mexico, I am still paying for that wall to this day, because God loves a good bit of irony to slap us back to our senses. The greatest irony of this all, though, is that after all of this pain, all this tragedy, all of this lost mental health struggles, everything I have been through over the last few years, I can genuinely say with every piece of my being, I am much happier now. And I know, I know this is going to sound like what the internet refer to as a cope, Lauren. I get it. However, I can assure you the only coping I was ever doing was pretending that everything was perfect in my life when I was married and trying to retain that image for so long. I suppose for the sake of transparency, I should tell you all that my husband, after a year of leaving my son and I with no financial support, essentially with no home as well, he eventually did change his mind. And don't get me wrong, if this had happened earlier in a different way, I would have been jumping with joy. But unfortunately, the way that he tried to come back into my life was somehow even more unhealthy than our marriage itself. It was a return built on threats and not love. And if I have learned one important lesson that everyone needs to hear from this video, it would be do not, do not stay in a relationship where the threat of abandonment or any other severe threats are dangled over your head in order to force compliance. And do not do this to your partners. It does not build a foundation for a happy, healthy marriage or world for your children either. Love and goodness just cannot thrive in fear. My husband's constant threats of abandonment and divorce, if I didn't jump through certain hoops, did not just hurt me as a person, they hurt my ability to be a good mom, a daughter, a friend, a wife, and I know it would do the same to any dad as well. I didn't know this at the time, but uh, what I was experiencing is typically referred to as a coercive control relationship. I learned this phrase in the process of successfully getting a court order to protect myself from some of the actions my husband took throughout this period. Quite frankly, I have hardly gotten into the details of some of the more abusive levels of coercive control that I did experience, but for the sake of my child, I would rather not have them immortalized on the internet forever, and also for the sake of growth. I don't really believe in putting people's worst moments online because I think that they should have an opportunity to leave those behind themselves and, and grow from them. I also want to reiterate that none of these actions or orders have to do with our son. I would never ever want anyone to get the idea that I've taken any action to keep them separate. Due to the nature of the relationship, the only request I had put in place legally was the need for a mediator for co-parenting. At this point, all requests and repeated open offers for mediation have been rejected. This is not something I wanted to get into the details of, but it is something I unfortunately know will be an accusation and something that is a deep moral issue for me, especially after all of my time advocating for equal rights among parents, so I really wanted to clarify that. It's been an overall awful situation that I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy, but as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, this really overall is not a tragedy story, so let's get into that part. I've addressed some of the big questions I'm sure people would have for me, and advice I've learned not through my own genius, but rather God and life humbling me uh, through my own mistakes. So I think it's time to answer the massive question of what do we do with someone like me? What do we do with people who have failed to achieve the ideal we have for life in our world? I think this is really the ultimate question of our time, because conservatives are allegedly trying to heal a broken world, and I think many too often don't understand how that world and those people became broken in the first place. And for young people like me in the early days of my politics, our only vision of traditionalism and family in the modern life is one sold to us by Norman Rockwell posters and Chad memes. Even if you're lucky enough to have parents still together, which gives you a leg up in perspective, our parents' dating experiences and social pressures were entirely different from our current times, meaning that when people like me and many others inevitably fail to live up to a PR campaign, it can feel like we are left in the dust, with nothing to go to but the modern approach. A worldview that not only accepts brokenness, but encourages brokenness as a virtue at times. And while acceptance can be very comforting in a cold world, and I think we have a lot to learn from that, gone too far can also lead to a lack of self-reflection and a deepening of one's brokenness. I long for a day, where those who claim to want to save civilization both acknowledge and love the broken while encouraging self-reflection and structure. Unfortunately, you rarely find both in one ideological camp. Worse, I find people feign that their cruelty is some sort of correctional compassion whilst only ever wielding it against their political enemies. The people we should be correcting the most in our lives are those who already know and respect us. And if you wouldn't be cruel to them for correctional purposes, why would you think cruelty would work on people who don't know or respect you at all? I won't lie, um, I nearly abandoned my political beliefs altogether just to cope with the confusion of what to do with myself, as my life's reality was so contradictory and confusing to my own political messages, as I assume a detransitioners would be to the left. This is why I think it can be dangerous to think about life too much in the political. Uh, you will twist and contort yourself into knots of insanity, trying to meet inhuman standards until you reach a point where you either have to lie about your life, which most in the political sphere do, or where you give up on trying altogether. And I have hit both points in this crazy journey. I definitely reached a stage in my life where- So I just wanna add in a little piece 
that I've been thinking about, which is that I think a lot of people are not super aware of, so Lauren is Canadian and I believe she's actually uh, location wise pretty close. So she's in BC. Uh, she grew up in BC. I've grown up in Alberta. Um, but socially we're in really similar groups. My understanding is she's from kind of a Protestant kind of non dommy Christian circle. And I don't know if anyone will care, but I wanted to give this added context, which is that divorce in my experience in these kind of like very white Protestant spaces is very strange. Um, Typically in the church, it's taught that the divorce is supposed to be handled like within the church community. So if like a divorce is about to come up and there's an irreconcilable difference, like the priests and pastors and like trusted elders should be intervening and mediating to try to fix the relationship essentially. But in a lot of church cultures that I've been in, this doesn't really happen. Or when it does happen, I find that like this is the issue with this model is that like the, the pastor and the elders are vastly under equipped to actually manage the marriage dynamic because after being married to somebody, even just for a couple of years, the reasons why your marriage is falling apart is extremely complex and very, very rarely self-evident. It usually takes a lot of work, a lot of digging to try to figure out that issues navigatable. In the case of Lauren's relationship, this is not a simple problem. This is not just like, oh, you know, husband, listen to her feelings and wife, like try to be a little bit like, you know, a little bit more emotionally regulated or like some like shit like that. That's not what's going on here. And to be honest, I haven't met a lot of couples where that works super well. I think that tends to like band-aid the solution. To give you a, a conceptualization as somebody who's also in a, grew up in a Protestant space and also went through a separation, people in your church will either be really really wonderful about it or awful um depending on the like space that you navigate but there's a lot of social stigma that will begin to become attached to you particularly as the woman um as far as the divorce and so while technically biblically like the church is supposed to come around the couple and like try to work them through it. Divorce is oftentimes for a lot of like for all people, of course, but in I want to tell you about like kind of the, the subculture of Christian white Protestant land. It's a deeply isolating experience because a really common experience in like white Protestant land is essentially, even though they say like, you know, love the sinner, but hate the sin and all that bullshit. Everyone knows that it's bullshit because what they mostly do is they go, Ooh, yucky. You've got some sin around you. I don't know if I want to touch that. Everyone gets a little bit and they, and they, they communicate this in like some of the most subtle, like shitty ways, which will be like, you'd be talking to like a woman's group about issues in your relationship and your frustrations with your husband. And everyone will like, just go silent. So it's like this passive quiet rejection. And when you're talking to people and you're like explaining the situation, they'll be like, Hmm. And they'll kind of go like quiet and tease off. So it's like, it's incredibly isolating and very shame driven. Um, and I would say in the Protestant land, there's a high amount of pressure, particularly on women to make the relationships work no matter what. Um, and there's a large offset of blame in white Protestant land on women for when marriages fall apart. Um, there's kind of this expectation of like being there for your husband, no matter what. And um, yeah, I've seen a couple of friends go through it and it can be really isolating in that social group uh, for pretty obvious reasons. And does not represent Protestants at all. I am, I don't know what to tell you. The only thing you can do, I literally said it's my experience. Um, I would say after talking with lots and lots of women, this is oftentimes who've gone through divorce in a white Protestant space. This has been the case. Um, are there certain Protestant communities that are going to be better than this? Yes, of course. Uh, but there is absolutely this kind of rigid expectation of like shiny goodness. Uh, and you lose a lot of social credibility and points when you don't maintain that. And this isn't like saying like all Christians are bad. I'm just being honest. It's very purity based. Where, after my husband left, as the months went, it actually Leroy. 
just to be clear, this experience didn't happen to me. Um, this experience didn't happen to me. We weren't super plugged into a church specifically, to be honest, but all the Christian community that we had around us was incredibly supportive. Uh, this isn't actually a personal experience. This is me relating to the experiences of lots of women I know in the church. I had a great experience for the most part. By and the reality started to set in, my life just became about surviving the day. I was in such a low state of depression that uh, there was just no grand vision anymore. I was angry with God for not answering my prayers. I turned my back on him as I have too many times before. And I just lived as if the future didn't exist. Just try to get through the day over and over and over, try to get out of bed, right? And I was uh, very, very mentally lost for a long time. This experience has really given me a useful sense of empathy and understanding for hurt and broken people that I find incredibly helpful in life and friendships. The trad wife LARPer I was is dead, but uh, perhaps the difference between that person and the person I am now is the same difference as a LARPer's character sheet and a real human being. I know now who I am much better. I am not some right-wing Valkyrie. I am not some bastion of conservative femininity. I do not want to be a saint of any ideology. I don't want to be held to anyone's standards because I know reality is far too confusing to, to be summed up in a listicle of goals or instructions. I can't do it. I'm sorry, but uh, I can be a redneck. I'm pretty good at that. I certainly love my freedom, guns. I don't trust the government. Uh, definitely, definitely much less than I even did before. And somehow it keeps going down to less levels of trust every day. And you know, despite everything that I've been through, all the craziness, I still do believe in love. I still do believe in duty. And I think they are not dead in this world. Or at least I very much want to believe in that. But uh, a lot of people, particularly the young, have already given up on things like love, duty, marriage, all of that stuff, which is why I think many young people are fleeing the right in droves. While some of this can definitely be attributed to modern education or media, it's always worthwhile looking inward on one's own messaging and where they could be missing things. I mean, really, telling a generation uh, made up of increasing numbers of children of divorce that the only parent, the single parent who stayed to raise them and gave them some semblance of what love and responsibility is, is the thing that's ruining Western civilization is not a strategy. Telling women and men who face divorce, separation, or failure to ever marry in the first place that they are worthless failures now is not a strategy. Telling young men who are constantly getting poorer relative to their elders and may never be able to afford to get married or get a home that the only reason they feel that way is because they're betas and not working hard enough is not a strategy. In fact, generally speaking, giving life advice about things you have never experienced and as such don't understand is not a strategy. It is just stupid. And no one, no one was more stupid than 20-year-old Lauren pretending a book report on marriage statistics was actual life advice. That advice got me trapped in a hell of my own making. And in order to get out of it, I have to do the one thing that a public figure cannot afford to do. I have to allow myself to be wrong. Life is a lot more complicated than ideals. No listicle or video screaming about what you should have done with your life will help a fundamentally broken person so much as actual help from real humans. I know I'm repeating this point, but it is important because I speak from experience. So believe me, when your mind has broken from pain, it just hurts more hearing someone remind you how broken you are. And because it hurts, you rebel. You make more bad choices because you don't care how right someone is once they have disrespected you. Fuck them. Better to spiral even further than to listen to someone like that. Mercifully, I had an entire community of friends and loved ones who prevented this from happening to me to catastrophic degrees, but not everyone is so lucky. And I certainly will not judge people whose lot I have been shielded from solely by fortune. People say kindness has not gotten us anywhere. I'm sure that's true for the internet <laughs> or any sort of political rally where you don't actually know anyone, but those environments are not real life. They're dark woods of error filled with tragedian Muppets pretending to be people that they aren't because the person they are is too broken too purposeless to acknowledge. The internet, Twitter, all of it. It's Plato's cave. 90% of the time you are looking at shadow puppets of people's lives and everyone, but especially people in the political sphere, have fallen for this puppet show. We get so much joy out of jeering at how cringy other people's shadow puppet selves are that we never bother to leave the cave and cut our own strings by encountering real humanity. Because real humanity is imperfect. Unlike the ridiculous, overpowered, implausible character sheets we write for ourselves on social media. But enough about uh, what I and the world get wrong. It's time for me to put my money where my mouth is, because if the conservative or really any commentary sphere does not have the answers for when your partner leaves you and your life falls apart, or when your marriage falls apart, whatever it is, I guess it is only fair that I tell you what I did actually do when that happened. 
Not because I have all the answers at all, uh, I don't, but because maybe it'll help uh, someone to know they're not alone and to see what path I took. After my husband said he did not want me to return to Australia and that he wanted nothing to do with me anymore, my parents took uh, me and my son in for nearly seven months when I got back home. As I mentioned earlier, I spent the last of the money I had in the bank supporting our marriage and I never got child support, alimony or anything like that. And I didn't have anywhere to live if my family didn't take me in. To this day, the only finances transferred has been from me to my ex, despite me earning less. I would not make such a point of this right now if the internet didn't act like this was some sort of impossible thing that could never happen. It does. It's cringe to admit how suicidally in love I was and desperate to fix things, desperate to give just everything to, to this marriage, even if the other person didn't want to fix it, and even if the things that needed fixing weren't mine to fix. But um, I also take some pride in this. We mock the hopelessly in love at times a lot, but I think more people should be hopelessly in love, if I'm being honest. But they should be hopelessly in love with each other. That's the key word. It should go both ways, especially if you're married. I know I gave it my all, and I can say having done that, it's, it's not a small comfort, it's actually a huge comfort. I feel I don't have to hold any shame there. I can always know in my head that I did everything I possibly could at that time. The way the internet describes separation can be very silly. Uh, when we talk about how the system is broken, I agree there are aspects of the family court that do hurt men, but ultimately I find it is largely broken in favor of people who are the most aggressive. If you don't want to get divorced, if you're the one trying to fix things, it seems like on both ends you get screwed, man or woman. Asking nicely for custody, asking nicely to co-parent or for child support, whatever it is. Uh, it, it does very little when dealing with a partner who refuses to mediate. Viciousness does work, and I certainly did not have the energy, the vibe, any of it to uh, get vicious or aggressive for money, especially when I was at a state where I really wanted to fix things. So I just made do. I lived at my parents' house in their spare bedroom, and uh, my son had, had the closet. It was a big closet. We made it look nice, but it was a very small space. And as mentioned earlier, uh, my mental health was not exactly going swimmingly at this point. I was struggling with a lot. But one of the incredible, beautiful things about having children is that they can save you as much as you can save them. You don't really have a choice to have a full-blown mental breakdown because you have the most incredible, beautiful human in the world relying on you. So I was able to pick myself back up and get into making actual monetized YouTube videos, streaming and doing some odd jobs behind the scenes. My parents were there through every step of the way, loving us and building us back up. And then their church stepped in. One of the biggest fears I definitely had uh, was not having good male role models for my son. I can say with extreme confidence now, he absolutely has those. The church has so many incredible kids groups he goes to, a swath of friends there, even the teenagers at the church just love him like there's no tomorrow and are involved in his life. We spend most of our days off-roading, swimming, going to the beach, sledding in the winter, exploring the Canadian wilderness, uh, spending a lot of time with his little mates. He's actually, uh, my friend Olivia is here filming with me and her daughter's playing with him right now. And uh, you know, he's got a lot of upstanding men and women in his life, the best of the best. One thing the internet is really not good for is tempering your feelings about the other gender after you've been in some sort of horrible breakup. It can be really easy to assign all of your life's pain to some sort of natural failure of the opposite sex to convince yourself there was simply no avoiding your position despite your decision making and partner. And I'm not saying every situation is the fault of an Sound like anyone? <laughs> individuals decision making and partner people can change overnight like you wouldn't believe but um what, what i'm trying to get at here is i've been lucky enough to avoid this resentment that i see uh, many others hold understandably but misguidedly so towards um the other sex after a separation well bad ones exist more than i thought when i was younger i was a bit delusional as a as a teenager and a young adult because i lived in a very safe you know conservative bubble okay this is a super good question ruchi chan thank you for sending it in also, very cute name. Do you think it's bad to try to do everything for the marriage, but not the actual person? Shouldn't wanting to be with someone the shouldn't wanting to be with someone be the main reason for marriage than marriage itself? I think this is a really good question for us to talk about, and I by no means have the perfect answer. Um, I think there are three relationships at play in any monogamous relationship that needs to be thought about. It is your relationship with yourself your partner's relationship with themselves, and your marriage. And the issue is, what I'm hearing from like Lauren's situation is, everything was being blamed as we have a problem in the marriage. But it sounds like, for the husband specifically, he had a lot of problems with himself. Not even not even bad problem. I'm not saying like, like like people like try to claim he's a narcissist and stuff like that. I'm not saying any of that stuff. I'm saying he committed to a relationship that didn't work with his life. He gave up a number of things in his life that he deeply valued for this relationship that he later came to regret 
and in his regret, thrust resentment on his partner for those decisions, right? So that's a relationship problem with himself, right? He's given up one of his core values um, and he now regrets and resents it. And I'm going to guess that there might have been marriage problems. It's just not super clear, right? The husband is going to say that there was marriage problems, um, specifically her. She's not working on herself. She's not fixing her ADHD or whatever. Um, in most marriages, all three of these things are going on at once, right? Um, there's a weird kind of uh, element of Lauren being this trad con wife, despite previously being this hyper motivated uh, polit political like Giga Chad Stacy who is like blowing up across the internet, right? And bombastic and explosive. So in many ways, it's like, was Lauren ever, ever really like the trad con wife specifically? I don't know. It's hard to say. And this is the issue. This is the main thing that we're all missing from this context is what was their dynamic like, right? We have no idea at all. He's saying it was just like ADHD related symptoms, according to her. Is that the case? I doubt that. Um, but I, I'm not saying that he didn't say that. I just don't believe that that's actually what broke the relationship. And so this idea of like, if she just kept investing in the marriage, would it fix it? Well, depends. If she's not, because she at first was working on the marriage and then she started working on herself when he was like, it's not the marriage, it's yourself. And then, then the marriage still dissolved, which means that probably he needed to do some work here too, right? It's usually all three of these things that have to get fixed in a relationship. Uh, in my personal perspective. And so, and the problem is this third one, the marriage, tends not to rectify if there's still lots of problems with themselves, right? Um, there are many good men in this world. There are many. My vision of that has not been shaken, but if anything strengthened through this experience, I'd just say my vision and understanding of what good men are has maybe changed and become a little more reality-based. And things only got better from there. Eventually, after living uh, with my parents for those seven months, I was able to save enough money for rent to uh, get my own place for my son and I, an adorable little cabin in the woods that I knew would be good for us. Good, but not exactly comfortable. Uh, what running water there was was absolutely filthy to the point that you had to boil it if you wanted to drink it. That is, assuming it hadn't frozen over solid by the Canadian winter. The cabin was infested with ants, and for the first two weeks I lived there, I woke up to them falling on my face more times than I could count. And they were like <laughs> carpenter ants, they bite, but eventually got those out of the cabin. <laughs> Took a lot of effort. Again, it wasn't comfortable, but it was good for me because it grounded me in reality. It showed me what people have to deal with when they're barely scraping by and they have dependents. You don't really see that when you're a uh, gag influencer, traveling the world and living off the internet bullshit economy. You never have to deal with the same landlord struggles or the crippling financial burden of taxes without an accountant to shield your assets. You never have to really work, which might have given you a, a bit more sympathy for the working class had that been the case, like it did for me in this situation, much to the chagrin of my pull yourself up by your bootstraps kind of followers. And more than being a good hard lesson in reality, this experience living paycheck to paycheck with only other sufferers for company was truly unexpectedly beautiful. Um, you see, the cabin was actually located on a massive property, and I was not the only person living off the land there because we had fallen on hard times. In fact, I wasn't even the person who had fallen the hardest necessarily in my, in my surroundings. It was, for lack of a better term, a, a trailer park I was living in. <laughs> and uh, some of the people there didn't even have trailers. Some of them just lived out of their cars or vans, or as in the case of one absolute legend, rented a shed with a tarp over it. If you're like the spoiled influencer I was once upon a time, you probably can't imagine how that could be beautiful. You're still part of a world where people assume that people at a trailer park are all unemployed drug addicts, hookers, or future victims of a serial killer. Uh, you might even assume that those people are just trash waiting to be dumped in a landfill. How, you wonder, could this situation I was in possibly be beautiful? Well, it was. You know, <laughs> those stereotypes you have in your head, those stereotypes I may have had in my head, dead wrong, I'll tell you right now. In that environment, one that most people would regard as forsaken, I found something precious. Uh, after years of talking about this longing and this need for community, I finally got to experience it. Uh, eventually all of us would meet each other, knock on our doors, have chats about the day, and we started gathering for bonfires down by the water in the middle of the woods almost every night during the summer. A community dinner or drinks where we'd all bring stuff to share, and my son and I would come out, we'd play by the river, go for walks in nature, sing and dance every night at this fire with all of these incredible people that just took us in and loved us. 
Oh, they, no. they would show them how to collect firewood, play catch, climb trees, all of it. And everyone there would just help each other out. Not for reward, but out of genuine love and just care for one another. For example, people always let me know they felt safer on the property, uh, which was crawling with bears because I had guns there. They could call me up if they needed me. Others had plumbing or cooking skills that could help out. And it was literally the type of group where I could text someone for a cup of sugar and they'd bring it over so we could all have cookies together and dance to King Harvest, whatever it was at the bonfire. To a right winger. This would seem like communism. <laughs> in fact, many of us joked that we were just waiting for a hippie cult leader to come along, but they never did because to a left winger, uh, I'm sure we just looked like a bunch of trailer park deplorables. Maybe we were, but that environment, the type of people you find in these environments, uh, you never know what their paths are gonna be. Some people just were, didn't have to live there, but chose to be there because they wanted to escape from it all. Like the rat race of society that constantly has demands put on us all of, of status symbols and you have to be getting more money and they just, screw that, I'm gonna go live in nature with all these people. Others have extremely dignified pasts, like you wouldn't believe, incredible educations and jobs. Uh, you know, some people lost those jobs during COVID because of lockdown policy and rental prices are just ridiculous in Canada. So my, you know, my judgment of places like that has been completely flipped on its head. Uh, there, there's, a, there's a lot more going on there than, than what people's assumptions would say. And as for me, you know, you might wonder what these people thought of my job and what I did. Well, they didn't care. <laughs> I wasn't Lauren Southern, scourge of the libs, baby boomers, immigrants in Islam. I was just Lauren. That's it. And I liked being just Lauren there. Um, just Lauren did a lot more for her community than Lauren Southern ever did. Because as just Lauren, I didn't have the luxury of being a brand. I was actually just a human being, just me. <laughs> and that was pretty damn cool. I think the best part of being in that community was the kind of people who, who live there and, you know, can relax and, and just have a fire every other night are people who aren't interested with power. And uh, that is the complete opposite of the political world I've spent most of my life in. And I think among people who are not interested in power is where peace is found. That's certainly where I found it in my life. The most I've seen in my life, for sure. Today I have gotten my feet back under me and moved away from that world, tragically, but it will always stay with me and with it has come a lesson that I desperately needed. That just as benevolent sexist attitudes don't automatically make someone a good husband, ideology doesn't create community. Ideals don't make a positive community. Shared needs and struggles do. And while I am back in the comfortable world where water runs year round and central heating works, I will never let myself become so alienated from reality again. I will never forget what community truly is again. And on that note, it would be remiss of me not to thank some of the people who formed my community today, because on top of the community I joined in the woods, in the trailer park, uh, there were others who helped me during these rough periods. I got to rebuild a lot of the relationships I had from childhood before I got into politics. And a lot of those girlfriends came out to help me set up my home, just loved me, showed immense support to me. Olivia, shout out. <laughs> you all know who you are and thank you very much. And while I kept it all pretty private, uh, there were a few people in the political world who helped me navigate this all and helped me during what was a total emotional and mental breakdown for me. I want in particular to thank Evelyn Ray, who some of you may know uh, for, through her Twitter account or the videos she's done. She was there for me through so much of this all, literally giving my son and I a bed to sleep in whenever we needed it, feeding us, one of the few people I knew in Australia. And uh, I cannot speak highly enough about that woman. She is an incredible soul. I am forever thankful for her and everyone else in the political world. Once again, you guys know who you are. It, it means a lot to me that you kept my secret and helped me navigate some really insane waters. I'm now at a point where I've built up such a wonderful group of humans around me that I truly believe we have created the best life possible with our current limitations for my son and I and continue to do so every day. If the right wing world I was a part of uh, in my life was correct about anything, uh, it was definitely, at least for me, that being a mother is the most fulfilling and beautiful aspect of my life. It really is. I, there isn't a day I wake up regretting the way that my life went when I see my son, <laughs> sorry. I would not take back a single thing that has happened to me because I get to see my son smile every day and tell me that I, he loves me every day. It's like the most incredible thing in the world. I wouldn't change it. It is truly one of the deepest joys that I've found in life. You know, life is still a struggle. I've got legal debt. I'm not rich by any stretch, but I have learned well that Making money the most important thing in one's life can eat your soul. And I rather like having a soul, even if it is in rehab. I also certainly don't have that wonderful right-wing Valkyrie trad wife image that is so nice to curate anymore. But you know what is nicer than having a good public image? You know what ultimate irony God threw at me so as to deliver me from the nine circles of social media? It took me losing my marriage and the false image of myself I had created to finally encounter and really feel real love. And that was sure as hell worth it, and still is. 
I think I'm probably going to take a little bit of a break from doing videos for a bit, maybe a few months, enjoy the summer, let this sink in <laughs> with my audience. But uh, when I get back, I think I want to include a lot more honesty in my videos, a lot more real me and the experiences I've had in my life. Honestly, some of the best, most educational, funniest stories I, I have to tell are ones that I've never told anyone because they don't fit neatly into any sort of narrative. And also some of them are just things that I'm like, whew. I don't think I can talk about this for like 10 years because it's a bit crazy. Ask me about my trip to the Arctic Circle at some point. That was a wild one, but ask me in like five or 10 years. And I'm excited. I'm, I'm just excited to share a bit more of what the real world is like rather than what I feel we're expected to say as political influencers and characters on YouTube. I don't really want to be that. I've, uh, I've woken up at 27 and decided this is... <laughs> uh, sticking with the talking points isn't necessarily what I want to do with my life. And I think there's a lot more depths that... I've discovered in my personal life that I think I can bring to the internet too. But yeah, like I said, I'll probably take a bit of a break. I appreciate you all watching this. I have no idea how this is going to land. Probably your guys' reaction to my whole truth video is the one thing that made me confident enough to make this one because I didn't expect that to land well at all. And it really seemed a lot of you enjoyed the honesty and, and felt uh, the internet needed more of that. So I appreciate that. And I appreciate all of you who have supported me through these years, through all this chaos. I apologize if you feel lied to with everything I've kept a secret, but I hope you can understand it's been something I've, I've had to process and work through to get to this point of joy with my life and, and comfort and mental healing to be ready to tell the world and bring you in on my journey. But I appreciate you. I appreciate everyone who uh, has stuck around. And I hope that uh, some of my journey that I've shared resonates with you. I look forward to reading your comments and seeing if it did. But yeah, I'm going to go head out and play with my kid and Olivia, go to the beach. It'll be good. Have a good one. <laughs> you did it. Uh, there's not much to say. Uh, I know a bunch of you were asking why I wasn't saying anything. Um, it's amazing what touching grass, being a human, and Talking to other humans who you particularly, here's the really powerful message to me in this, is spending time with people who your political ideology would paint as a monster. Um, really spending time with them, not sitting around a table at a podcast screaming about a topic, but having a bonfire, um, hearing about their life, hearing about who they are. Um, I think both both sides of the political spectrum need to do this. I think just in general, people are so tribalistic. We need to like spend a little time in the other tribes village um, to see them complexly and understand them. And if you spend enough time in them in other groups, you'll you'll have a whole bunch of criticisms of them, right? You're gonna have a whole bunch of frustrations with conservatives or with liberals or with lefties or um whatever other group but so many of our like fundamental assumptions about others is like based on not spending enough time on them with them um that it makes it really tough right you like li m miss the human piece even though at the same time you know like when i think about certain groups that I like have a lot of beef with um it's like yeah but all my criticisms of them seem pretty valid and based and it's like yeah but what's what's the like the human element that I'm missing in all of this right um her being confronted with becoming a single mother forced her necessarily to have empathy for single mothers so the question is can you cultivate that without having to like live live the experience itself is really important. Does it have to be left or right? It doesn't, but that's that's kind of the way our tribes are organized right now, right? We have like such staunch political tribing. Uh, it doesn't have to be left or right. Sometimes it's racial. Sometimes it's gender, right? That's it's men versus women. Um, I'm just using political as an example. Uh, I really am talking about like the tribalistic nature of see as seeing non-included group as other and lacking the capacity to understand. You don't have to agree, but to at least understand how they emerge where they are. I think it's really valuable. <laughs>